Great, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started. And I'd like to say thank you to Tara and Sam for joining us tonight and bringing uh, some of our ambassador animals for you to get to know further. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you to our friends that are joining us online tonight, as well as in person. My name is Liz Larson. I'm uh, the Vice President of Programs here at the zoo. And so pleased to bring to you tonight our final presentation in our lecture series, Women in Wildlife Conservation. So tonight we're gonna be highlighting the work that Hogel Zoo does, Hogel Zoo does throughout the state. Uh, Kaylee and Tori tonight are gonna be talking about how they engage our community and conservation and a variety of other initiatives that will hopefully be new to you. Tori is our conservation, Tori Bird is our conservation action coordinator. Uh, she came to us uh, after she finished up at the University of Utah with a, a bachelor's of arts in ecology and organismal biology. What she enjoys most about her job is seeing how people's attitudes towards the Jordan River changes when uh, they participate in some of her events. And then they talk about how they're going to be telling their friends and family to come back and enjoy the river. Her hope for the future is exemplified when parents come with their kids and engage in nature and do something beneficial for wildlife. That really resonates with me too. Kaylee Mullen is our Utah Conservation Program Supervisor. She joined the Hogel Zoo team over five years ago after she completed her master's in biology where she studied environmental DNA to monitor fish and amphibians in altered and restored areas. She came to us from the Central Washington University. She recognizes that she has a pretty special job and not many people have the luxury of enjoying coming into work and really enjoying what they do every day. And her hope for the future is seeing people get involved in conservation activities. Hello everyone, welcome to our people online. We've just had a, a large group show up, so we'll give them a minute to get settled. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Is this the group that came down from Logan? Oh, what a special journey that you made to come down to us. We really appreciate it. And we are getting ready to start our presentation and I'm gonna turn our time over to Kaylee and Tori. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm Kaylee Mullen. If you're just arriving now, we're gonna be talking to you today about women in conservation and the conservation work that we're doing here at Hogel Zoo. Okay, this is the last of our Women in Conservation presentation series. And I wanted to talk just a little about women in conservation. So I'm gonna dive right in. Between 1966 and 1977, David Wade Chambers, who is a social scientist in Australia, asked almost 5,000 children to draw a scientist. That was the only instruction given, just draw a scientist. Uh, in the 80s, we got to compiling all of these drawings and of the almost 5,000 drawings, only 28 had scientists drawn as female. That was 0.6% of all scientists drawn. Each of those 28 drawings was drawn by a girl. Known as the draw a scientist test, it has been repeated 80 times since then. And we can see the trend is changing. More female scientists are being drawn. Uh, most recently, we had 28% of scientists drawn as women in 2016. And you can see here that that shift is really being driven by young girls. Now more than half of young girls are depicting scientists as female. But we still have twice as many male scientists being drawn. These statistics come from the US Bureau of Statistics from 2020, and it shows just the percentage of jobs held by females in certain STEM categories. So 46% in biological sciences, and then we're decreasing just 17% in engineering um, and architecture. And then in 2021, women were earning 75 cents on the dollar in natural resource management. 
why is this happening? Uh, there's a few things, a few theories put forward. One is just gender stereotypes, kind of this product of the past. It was a very male dominated field in the past and we are trying to change that, but it just takes time. So we have these male dominated cultures in STEM fields and they kind of perpetuate this idea that it's very inflexible. STEM fields aren't gonna work very well raising a family. And in turn, we have fewer role models, both in real life and in film, books, popular culture, to inspire the interest of women going into STEM um, areas. And it is shown that as young as kindergarten, math ability of girls is underestimated by parents and teachers alike. So we're gonna dive in to just biological sciences right now. And you can see that females are kind of trendsetters in some areas, animal care and human health care. There is more women than men in these jobs. But when you look at these field-based jobs again, kind of wildlife, land management, we see that drop off. There was a recent literature review of 230 papers, uh, 230 peer-reviewed articles. And it revealed this uncomfortable truth that women's voices are severely lacking in conservation. And this isn't just in kind of rural communities far away. This is shown to be here in large organizations in the West, in the USA, in Europe, kind of throughout the whole conservation field, women's voices are lacking, especially in the decision-making uh, positions kind of higher up in that hierarchy. To bring it a little closer to home, I looked at AZA institutions in Utah and the border states. We have 19 of them. And in five of those institutions, we have CEOs and presidents who are female. So that's about 25%. Um, it's a little outweighed still when you think about the zoo workforce. We're about 65% female, 35% male. Um, but when I looked at the Hogel Zoo directors, we are a 50-50 split male-female, so it's good to know that we're working um, in a nice, equitable zoo. Uh, one of the ways that we're helping women get into conservation is our conservation internships. So open to all. We have them for summer and spring, and we've been really lucky to get a grant from the Beagle Foundation so that we can help fund people through these internships who are usually minorities in the field, and that includes anyone that identifies as a woman. Um, we'll go to the next slide and see some of the skills that our interns are learning. And there could be a video here too. But you'll see here, we're taking a lot of time to just be outside and feel comfortable in the field, uh, both literally and figuratively. We're learning trail camera maintenance, wildlife monitoring, habitat restoration, um, GPS navigation, species ID, all skills that are going to help people break into a conservation career. Uh, to date, we have put 14 conservation scholars through the program, 12 of which have been female. And I know we're not meant to go word heavy on slides, but these are just some of the things that our interns have said about our internship program. It just tugs at my heart springs. We get really, really emotionally connected to our interns. So it's just really nice to see them go on um, and find really cool jobs. They're working at the DNR, working at the aquarium. Uh, they've gone on to do masters at the U in urban planning with kind of a sustainable focus, working at Wasatch Community Gardens. Uh, Louise is doing a PhD at Northumbria University using community science in northern communities to track a changing climate. So some really cool things are happening. And then just last week, we got this um, quote from Jade. She just got a job in Texas working with hawks and tortoises. Um, and she considers the internship a springboard into her career. And that is just like a huge, hugely grateful feeling that I have to be a part of this. Of course, not everyone has the time um, to commit 40 hours a week to a conservation internship, and not everyone wants to work in the field of conservation, but most people do want opportunities to connect with the land around them and play a part in that stewardship, really look after their wildlands, their natural resources, the animals that surround them. Um, so we do have other types of community engagement here at the zoo. Um, if you think back to our presentations, if you were lucky and saw them or saw them online, we had Colleen, Mary, and Tommy 
And they each said that none of the projects would work without community involvement and community engagement. And we kind of feel the same way. Um, so go to the next slide and talk a little about community science. This is a really cool form of community engagement. Uh, you might hear it as citizen science or crowdsourced science. It is members of the public conducting scientific research. It has a ton of benefits. It could be really long term. It could be really large scale, and this makes it very cost effective. Um, you can just train people who are interested in the subject to collect data. It can be from the PC. It can be outside. Um, there's a ton of cool things out there. And it's filling in so many data gaps, the kind of data collection that just cannot be done by one scientist, one lab, one university. Um, and what I really like about it is it increases transparency between the general public and the agencies doing this work. So with the Forest Service, looking after your public lands, with different universities, like you're really a part of that scientific process. And there's been a ton of community science interest in the past probably two decades. Uh, a really popular one that you might have heard of is the Audubon Christmas Bird Count. That was started in, the, in 1900 and is the longest citizen science program in the USA. Uh, and it really fosters a lot of public engagement and interest. So when we were building out our projects here at the zoo, we wanted to make sure that we were hitting all of these targets, making very accessible, um, different programs, diverse interests, different time commitments, and we're gonna talk about some of them now. Sorry. Next, we considered location. One of the great things about the location of Hogel Zoo is that we have an already tangible connection to the Jordan River right on our grounds. Immigration Creek runs directly through the zoo and into the Jordan River. The Jordan River is also 52 miles long. It runs from Utah Lake to the Great Salt Lake wetlands. That gives us 52 miles of potential touch points with our community. And finally, need. Uh, if you've been to the Jordan River, you've probably experienced a lot of the needs that it has. You might have seen invasive species such as Phragmites or Scotch thistle. There is a lot of pollution that happens because it's an urban river. This crowds out wildlife and can be mistaken for food and cause damage to their uh, digestive systems. All seven of the surrounding creeks in our canyons run directly into the Jordan River, which means that any of the pollution that gets into any of those creeks ends up in the Jordan. There is a single trash boom on the Jordan River right before it flows into the Great Salt Lake wetlands. And this trash boom collects two to three tons of trash about every three months. So when you think about all this, it's really clear that there is a distinct conservation need here. All of these things can, together uh, made the Jordan River a really ideal spot for our community conservation projects. So on the next slide, I have some numbers because I love numbers. <laughs> um, we've hosted 44, or, yeah, 44 events for our staff and volunteers since 2018. We've engaged more than 500 participants in over 1,800 hours, planted 400 plus trees, hundreds of pounds of puncture vine, that's also known as goat's heads, those really nasty burrs that you'll get in your feet or your bike tires or your pet's feet. And I haven't even counted up the number of pollinator plants we've done or the miles of rivers we've cleaned. I really like this graph. It's a great visual or this map. Um, the green are cleanups. The purples are uh, invasive species removal. The blue are pollinator plantings and the red are tree plantings. So it's a really great way to see the stretch and the reach that we've had with this program. These are just some fun pictures of our events. We work really hard to make them welcoming, accessible to all people of ages and all abilities. Uh, one of my great joys is that I have a couple of families that have been coming to these events since we started. And they have actually had children in that time. And those children now come. I have a couple of really cute two-year-olds uh, that look real good with some clippers. Um, another thing that we've been able to do is create these library nature kits. In December of 2020, we were, or 2021, no, 2020, we were awarded a grant by the, Associ the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Party for the Planet Spring Into Action Program, which is funded by the Disney Conservation Fund. A portion of those funds that year were used for some of our events along the river, 
we were also able to create these really fun library nature kits that are available in all Salt Lake City and County libraries. You can see the sweet video here showing off what is in that kit, binoculars, bug viewer, macro photography lens, uh, species ID cards, as well as information about how to nature journal and use iNaturalist so that these people can also be participating in community science while they're using these kits. In the first six months of circulation, they were checked out over a thousand times and we've heard some really great testimonials, such as from the family of this young boy who has checked it out several times and has now decided he wants to be a wildlife biologist. We are incredibly excited to have gotten this grant again, and we are expanding this program into Utah County Libraries this year. One of my other fun projects is Wild Aware Utah. It is a non-advocacy partnership between Utah's Hogle Zoo, USU Extension, and the Division of Wildlife Resources. Uh, the Wasatch, it aims to educate our community and state visitors about how to live and recreate safely with wildlife. The Wasatch Front is one of the fastest growing regions in the nation, with the population expected to nearly double between 2010 and 2050. This population growth will inevitably, inevitably come with a growing wildlife urban interface, which will also probably come with increased human wildlife interactions. We want to make sure that those interactions are positive for people, property, and wildlife. So to do this, we have three main messages through this program. The first is be aware of the wild and learn about Utah wildlife. The second, share the wild, respect wildlife and change behaviors as necessary. And finally, care for the wild, take action, coexist safely, and help wildlife stay wild. Hogle Zoo's main stake in this is that by making people more educated and comfortable in the wild, we can make sure that these interactions are positive and reduce the chances of these, these wildlife being dispatched after negative interactions so will help maintain our healthy populations. In order to achieve these goals, we maintain an award-winning website. We uh, supply uh, organizations throughout the state with educational materials. We go and we talk to classes and conferences, um, and we've created trail signs, and we host one of my favorite events at the zoo, Wild Aware Utah Day. We've had some great participation here. <laughs> we also strive to create ways to engage both our staff and zoo guests in conservation actively and passively while on zoo grounds. We've done this through the planting of multiple pollinator gardens, including maintaining stands of milkweed, which is the only plant that monarch butterflies lay their eggs on because it is the only plant that the caterpillars eat as they grow. I was lucky enough to capture this female monarch laying eggs on one of our stands this year. We really hope that they'll continue to find these plants so that we can do our part to help bolster this declining population. We've planted these gardens with staff, summer camp participants, and zoo guests during our Party for the Planet events. We also strive to uh, decrease our carbon and water footprints. We do this through LEED certified buildings, green building standards, green guiding practices for all of our staff and a robust recycling program. We also get to partner with some amazing organizations such as the Future Farmers of America and Salt Lake County Watershed and Restoration who have a willow stand on our, gar willow nursery on our grounds and a garden. The willows grown at our nursery are used by Salt Lake County Watershed Restoration in their restoration projects along the Jordan River, and fruits and vegetables grown at the FFA garden will be fed out to our animals here at the zoo. Uh, and one of my favorite things we've been able to do is through a partnership with Tree Utah, we've given out over a thousand trees to community members to promote local water-wise plantings. And then we have a fun trail camera project. In 2020, we launched, launched this project as part of the water, wider Wasatch Wildlife Watch project. <laughs> it's a lot of W's. And we put 25 cameras over 20 miles of the Jordan River. And in about two and a half years, we collected over 1.8 million photos. And these photos have really highlighted to us the importance of the Jordan River, not just as an urban corridor and place for people to connect to nature, but as a really vital wildlife habitat. While this research was originally focused on the river, 
word has gotten out that this is something that we've become pretty proficient in. And we now also have cameras in some of the surrounding canyons as part of the watershed restoration initiative. This project also has the advantage of not only having a field based portion where we go out and physically check the cameras, but it also has a large office based portion where we have to sort through these 1.8 million photos, delete things that are uh, not wildlife, grass growing, those sorts of things. And then we have to identify the wildlife in this. So this is a really great project for people who may want to connect to conservation, but be unable or not interested in going out into the field with us. So we've had volunteers put in over 230 hours into helping us sort and identify these photos. And something really gratifying for me and Kaylee, I think, is that this data is already being used and published. We have been published in one paper with, through Snapshot USA, and there are two papers currently being written with this data, one looking at the effects of COVID-19 and lockdowns on wildlife movement, and one looking at the effects of gentrification on wildlife. It's really gratifying to be able to see this data being used and published already. So I think I'm gonna pass it over to Kaylee to show you some of our favorite photos. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, I thought for um, <clears throat> collective joy, we could just take a little break and look at some of the photos we've caught on our trail cameras. Um, so here we have a trio of striped skunk. We have a couple of tussling mule deer. Next one, yeah. Uh, we have two busy beaver. We have a little hawk selfie. We have an owl crash landing. We have a Westland tanager flyby. A bobcat, a moose, a very interested moose. And what's really fun is we're not just seeing species and animals, we can see some behaviors too. Um, so here we see a raccoon with a fish dinner running from his friend. Um, and then I highlight some issues we have along an urban river too. So we have a domestic cat um, catching birds, which is a problem I'm sure we're all familiar with and know is happening. Um, and here are a ton of red foxes because they are my second favorite animal in the world. And if you've ever seen me speak before, you know what's coming next. It's the toads. <laughs> um, so our boreal toad monitoring program is our biggest and longest running and I'm going to say most loved community science program here at the zoo. Um, it's a really cool program where I get to take volunteers out to these just amazing parts of Utah. Boreal toads are a high elevation species. They live at 5,000 foot and above. So we're kind of surveying all along that central spine of Utah, those mountain tops, those alpine lakes. Um, I just get to take people with me and connect people with these really amazing native amphibians. And I get students, retirees, herpetologists, hikers, hobbyists, everyone comes out who's interested in just seeing more of Utah and connecting with these amphibians. And what's really cool is we get to work alongside federal, state, and other nonprofit biologists. It's a really great, accessible way to kind of connect with people working in the field. Uh, but why are we doing this? So the DWR, the Division of Wildlife Resources, has designated boreal toads as a species of greatest conservation need, an SUCN, because they are declining across their range. And in, I think, nine of the 10 states they are found, they have dedicated conservation action plans to try and slow that decline. So what we are doing is monitoring uh, known populations, and then we're surveying other wetlands that have the habitat characteristics that boreal toads like to try and discover more populations in Utah to so get a really good grip on their range and how they're doing over time. And what's really great is all of this data is going back to the division, uh, and the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's being used in their management. So all the work that our community scientists are doing is making an impact on the conservation of this species. And we've been doing it for a while now, so it really allows the DWR to focus on other SGCN species uh, that are kind of competing for that time with no detriment to the boreal toad. Uh, when we find a toad, we take GPS points of where they are, we take habitat data, 
including water quality, such as pH, temperature. We take biometrics, so we'll measure and weigh the toad, and that will let us know kind of how old the toad is, um, its life stage. Any size of breeding, eggs, tadpoles, metamorphs, we're really interested in where they're breeding. Uh, sometimes the state will do chytrid swabs across the whole state. So when we're involved in that, we're taking a Q-tip and just tickling under the little armpits, sending it to the lab. And uh, finally, we're pit tagging the toads. And this is very similar to a microchip you might have in your pet cat or dog, tiny, tiny little chips under the skin. And then we can ID that toad for the rest of time. And they have been IDing certain toads for over 15 years now. So they're long lived out there. So just in this program alone, we've hit over 150 survey sites. We've had 200 individual people join us out in the wilds. And we've put in over 10,000 field hours, which is a really pretty awesome number to hit. Um, so I thought I'd show you some photos from the field. I know it sounds like a dream job, and it is. But there's um, some, <laughs> some things that happen out there. You can get stuck in a swamp. Um, it can surprise snow on you in August when you wake up. Um, maybe one of your interns locks a key in a federal truck. <laughs> Um, in someone with no cell service. We got it out, don't worry. Um, sometimes it feels like every plant on earth is there just to puncture your tire. Um, I have gone through two in a day before, never again. <laughs> but it's all worth it in the end um, because when people find toads, we see all well, their faces say it all. And again, we kind of went over some of the benefits of community science. But again, specifically, I really feel like this program really increases kind of environmental literacy. It makes really great connections with people and their local wildlife. And it gives people this kind of self-importance and belief that they can make a difference to their local conservation programming. Um, so that's just part of it. And although not specifically tied to community science, I can't really talk about boreal toes without talking about our breed and release program. Um, a lot of people don't know that we have a boreal toad conservation center because it's not currently publicly accessible um, on grounds. It's just known affectionately as the toad room. And we have over 20 toads down there. Amphibians are really great candidates for ex situ or offsite conservation because of their small body size, their low space requirements. Um, they have a ton of babies. There's not very much parental care. It makes it all very... Um, easy to raise a lot of toads at one time, um, but they're very fickle lovers. It is actually not as easy as putting a male and a female toad together. Um, we did everything. We mimicked their natural conditions, photo period, temperature. We played breeding calls of other amphibians that had come across in the wild. We hibernated them. Uh, Denver Zoo actually cracked the code and they have a certain hormone treatment that they implemented in 2019. Uh, so we hopped on board along with Omaha Zoo and the Love and Living Planet Aquarium. And we have all been successful in breeding and releasing toads now. And we released 64 toadlets, which is a real word, in summer 2021. And we are set to release um, hopefully over 100 this year is the goal. So this is a really cool program and we're really keen to kind of scream and shout about it and let people know about it. So in our new Wild Utah exhibit that we have recently broken ground on, uh, we are building a brand new building called the Norman Matheson Education Animal Center. And the Boral Toe Conservation Center is actually breaking out from underground and it's gonna be showcased in this building, which is really exciting. Um, so not only can we showcase this really cool amphibian conservation work, we can highlight a ton of other Utah wildlife, um, issues they're facing and the work that we are doing and not just us but all of our partners that we work with really opening up that conservation kind of screen for people and show them different opportunities they can get involved with right here in Utah and lastly this is going to give us a space to really do more outreach more events these photos are from our very first uh, nature fest that we held with the Tracy Avery and the Natural History Museum last year um, it was a hit. We're going to do it again in April, Nature Fest uh, version two. And such as World Way Utah Day that Tori talked about. We do career treks. We do classes where you can learn about the different sounds um, 
different sounds. So different calls that frogs make, so you can ID them by sound if anyone's interested in doing that. Um, they will be coming up in spring. Party for the Planet, we started our new guest engagement, Caterpillars Count, this year. Uh, that is a nationwide community science program looking at how insects may be changing their timing to climate change. Um, and we had guests helping us do that. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Tori for some take home messages. <laughs> we got it, I think. <laughs> so through this presentation, we really hope that we've been able to highlight the importance of making conservation accessible, not just for women, but for everyone who has traditionally played a minority role in this field and to our larger community. Pogol Zoo is doing this through our conservation scholars, through community science, through on-grounds guest engagement, and our new exhibit. We hope this highlights the really unique role that the zoo plays as a conservation organization, how we're able to leverage our reach in our community, the folks coming through our gates, to connect them to meaningful conservation work in a way that some other conservation organizations are not able to, and that we're able to really unify our community to create a space for people to become champions for wildlife. So thank you all for being here, for being champions for wildlife yourselves. Um, and we're, I think we have a, if you're feeling like you would like to donate here, we have some QR codes that will also come up on the screen. They're on your table. Um, but I like to end with this take action side. Um, so often when we talk to people, they say things like, I had no idea. They had no idea the challenges that wildlife was facing. They had no idea the conservation work that Hogel Zoo was doing. And then the next thing they say is, what can I do? And there are so many things that you can do far beyond donating money, coming to things like this. Um, you can eat a little bit less meat, reduce your carbon footprint. You can meter your water. You can reduce your water footprint. You can host a stuff swap. This is one of my favorite things. Get your friends together and share stuff for free. You don't need to buy new things. Uh, you can join us for things like Frog Watch, the Jordan River, the Boreal Toad Surveys. But I think that most importantly, you can talk about it. You are a very unique audience who knows all of these things and you talk to a lot of people. So go and tell them the things you know. Make sure that the next time we talk about this, we're not hearing, I had no idea. And now we'll open it up for questions. Uh -huh. I do have a question. Uh, when you were talking about the Jordan River Conservation Project, would uh, 600 fish pounds puncture meat or uh, puncture vine? Right. Um, I didn't hear. I couldn't tell if you said planting. Or oh. <laughs> All right, so the question is whether the 600 plus pounds of puncture vine was being planted or pulled. That's pulled. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are removing these invasive species. We mainly focus on the puncture vine and scotch thistle. I do have a slightly funny story where I was at Christmas dinner and my uncle said, Tori, I have a confession to make. I said, what is it, Fred? I said, when I was a Boy Scout, we went to the Jordan River and we planted Russian olives. <laughs> <laughs> it broke my heart. So now we go back and we take them out. <laughs> Other questions? So the question is, since the river is an urban river going through the center of Salt Lake, what challenges have we faced? One of the main challenges we face is that it runs through 18 municipalities and they don't always talk to each other and they don't always wanna do things in the same way. So you have portions of the river where like you have Draper on one side and Riverton on the other and Riverton might put in a lot of time and money into something like Phragmites control, but this is a wind dispersed plant. So if on the other side of the river, they're not doing that same work, it's kind of all moot. So getting the, um, municipalities to work together and then getting all of the proper permissions because we might start a cleanup in one municipality and then move into the next. So it's really difficult when there's so many players. Mm 
Yeah, that's a great question. The question was, is it chytrid fungus or other things mostly at play in the boreal toad decline? Uh, it is really a cocktail of things. Chytrid fungus is a huge deal. Um, I think most of our sites in Utah are chytrid positive. So a lot of our toads have been living with that fungus for a while. Um, we can get into genetics and how different populations are responding. But overall, boreal toads are not very resistant to chytrid fungus. So if it isn't getting them directly, it is weakening their system enough that they're weaker to other stressors. So that in combination with poor environmental quality, maybe their habitat is declining, maybe they're having to travel further to get to what they need due to roads kind of dividing. They're quite a migratory species. They have these nice spring breeding areas and these upland summer foraging areas and they have to find somewhere to hibernate. So they need a lot of things to kind of be going perfect for them and just small triggers like that become big stressors when they have to also battle kind of a fungal infection. Um, so it's definitely part of it, for sure. Good question. A little of both. Um, so chytrid fungus is actually many species of it and most species can just live in the soil, live in the water um, and not affect the species around. This one species, Batrachochytrium dendrobiditis, is affecting amphibian <laughs> skin. Yeah. Um, there's debate on where it originated from, but some main theories are that it spread in the medical trade. So amphibians are used a lot in medical research. So maybe they've spread from one lab and gone all around the world. Another very sad theory is maybe researchers themselves have traced it through populations kind of with their boots going to different wetlands, um, but it is on every continent that amphibians are found. Um, and I think climate change is affecting how quickly it's spreading and how long it's staying in the environment as well. So kind of both, a lot of things up against it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So when you're doing field work for the boreal toads, um, the chytrid swabs are specifically to identify that fungus, right? Are there other health checks done to the toads to see if there are other um, conditions that are threatening mm. the population? Yeah, uh, so the question was if there's other health checks on boreal toads outside of the chytrid swabs. Um, I believe they are swabbing for chytrid. They may run it for ranavirus as well because we're swabbing um, frogs, salamanders, and toads at that elevation. I'm not 100% sure. We're sending them to the DWR and they're using their research station, I think in Logan, to run these swabs. Um, and then just general health checks, you're seeing um, if the toads are looking nice and plump, you know, they're quite a rotund species. Um, we've seen some abnormalities sometimes with metamorphs, um, but I think in the wild, it's so tough out there that they have to be kind of pretty healthy to get through hibernation, especially that's a very challenging thing on their little bodies. So we don't come across a lot of ailments with the toads out there, which is fortunate. It's nice to see happy toads. One of the other things in your presentation you did not cover, but I picked up on a different educational um, program that was presented here at Hobo Blue, was that the importance of the boreal toad population in Utah are indicators of the health of our wetlands, which the wetlands are also of the U.S. Um, our service um, is are dealing with some very serious issues about protecting the wetlands. And when they study the boreal toad population, that helps them to better understand where some of the wetlands are um, maybe not healthy. Yeah, that is exactly right. Um, many amphibians and especially sensitive ones like the boreal toad, we kind of consider them like a canary in a coal mine. So they are considered an environmental <laughs> indicator species. So once they start declining, because they have this porous skin, they are affected by declines in their environment much quicker than other animals. 
So you'll see maybe the amphibian species start to decline. And then you really have to kind of step up and think about why is this happening? Because that will have a cascading effect on the other animals in the area and not just really linked in the food chain, but by that actual environment itself, if it is the habitat quality that's declining. So yeah, seeing toads and seeing chorus frogs in these alpine lakes is a really good sign of kind of a healthy habitat, which is what we like. I can. Um, so chytrid fungus is, it's so hard to deal with because not only will it affect amphibian skin, but it can lay dormant in damp mud. It can shockingly be carried in the scales on birds legs. So we cannot do any kind of wide scale um, kind of treatment for this fungus. And if we did, we'd be taking out all the other beneficial funguses in the area. So once it's at a site, it is at a site. So there's a lot of really great research coming out of the University of Colorado in Boulder, and they're looking at how we can um, help treat individual toads. And the hope is now that we can either be pulling toads from the wild that have been living in this environment so long, they've got a natural resistance, kind of a very quick evolution next to this chytrid fungus, or if we are infecting them, with the fungus and then treating them and then putting them into the wild that they have this resistance already, kind of an inoculation, kind of a vaccine. Um, so it's hard to tackle, but what the fungus is actually doing is affecting the amphibian skin. And because they use their skin to kind of osmoregulate and balance out their salts and their um, kind of water, it affects them doing that properly. And eventually what you're gonna see is this kind of toughening and thickening of the skin they can't osmoregulate properly and that eventually starts affecting their organs and putting great pressure on their organs until they just can't keep up anymore as the fungus spreads throughout their body. Um, so it's really very sad. Sad to see. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you're Yeah, we um, have been lucky enough actually to just uh, redo our website. So we are putting more and more time into trying to really make it easy for people to see what we're doing. Uh, Tori has released a Jordan River calendar for the year that is on the Hogel Zoo website under conservation. And I'm putting together our toad survey season within the next month. And then I'll also be putting up our frog watch classes soon too. Winter is kind of our um, thinking time. And then in spring, we release all of the year's events. So please do check in over the next few weeks and you're gonna see more and more things coming up on our website and um, hopefully on our social media too, we'll start getting more things out. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mainly just through the zoo right now, we love working with partners. Um, we do a few things with Tracy Avery and the Lovely Living Planet Aquarium do have a colony of toads as well, but I don't think the aquarium are doing surveys like we are right now. Uh, the Avery has some really cool bird programs. They do a bird class, they do um, Let's Go Birding Together, and they do some wildlife walks along the river. Um, so we're not working directly with them, but they're a great crowd and I'd love to do some more for them too. One of the things that I'm excited about with the uh, aviary is that they have a birds and beavers project where they're looking at uh, beaver damage on old growth trees along the river to then try to protect them. Uh, and because we have trail cameras along the river, we're able to send them some data about where the beaver are so that they can be focusing their efforts on places where they know they're a beaver. So definitely we're really excited about working with um, and sharing data between our AZA institutions. Anything else? Yeah? You mentioned you building the zoo. Where is it going to be at? Have you been to the zoo uh, recently? So when you walk into the zoo, you're facing the Africa Savannah exhibit and everything else is to your right. Mm -hmm. And you can't really go to your left. 
So we're going to be opening up that area to the left. It's currently where the train goes through what used to be the um, like gold miners area. Uh, so all of that will open up and be wild Utah. I was just gonna see if we had a map on that slide, but it is quite small. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, yeah, that whole area. Yeah, so just to the left of this picture here is kind of the main entrance in the plaza. And then you'll come through here, you can see Emigration Creek will be there. Uh, the building is highlighted, I believe. I don't think this. I don't think this is helping. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. We love hosting this Women in Conservation lecture series. Um, it's been a really cool opportunity to connect to some of our international partners. And Kaylee and I can talk about this stuff forever. So we appreciate you being here, and letting us. <laughs> Thank you.